Okay, uh, great. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. I appreciate the, the introduction and just to say thank you to, to you and all the guys at Stat Sports for the opportunity to present today. I think it's, for me personally, it's great to be able to share this online stage, if you like, with the likes of Matt and Hanny and, and following some of those other webinars that have, um, have previously taken place, that they've been great. I think for me today, my presentation is, is going to touch on some aspects that have been spoken about, but I think the key will be how I've interpreted them and how I've tried to apply them within my own environment. And that's where the, the title of this has, has come from, I suppose, like developing our way is, is the process that I've taken in figuring out my physical development philosophy and how I've taken that and kind of molded it to suit the environment I'm in, which is, is Queen's Park Rangers. So just to give a, a brief introduction um, to myself before I get into it, like I said, I'm the first team sports scientist at QPR and I've been with the club now five seasons. I first joined uh, as, a, as an intern, as a first team sports science intern, and then spent the season in that role before then getting the opportunity to work in the academy. I did a year as the YDP sports scientist and then got the opportunity to then rejoin the first team at the end of that season. So. I've had great opportunity and uh, great enjoyment from all those different experiences and come across some really uh, top class coaches and managers, if you like, along the way. Prior to that, uh, as any young graduate trying to get into the football industry, I tried to get as much different and varied experience coaching everything, whether it was sports science, any role of sports science, strength and conditioning or football coaching, and did that uh, across the UK, US and Ireland. I say coaching because I, I put a real focus on football coaching as well and continued to pursue my coaching badges and coaching qualification throughout that time of study for me. I think one thing that was evident from those high level coaches I've come across and continue to come across is they can speak this, they've got common language with people they deal with. So I know some great strength and conditioning coaches that can understand the world of physiotherapy inside out and vice versa. But I suppose my skill set and where I saw myself developing into wasn't necessarily that role. It was trying to merge science and football. And, and I think the coaching license, um, I don't want to say it gives me a bit of credibility, but it helps me understand the, the world I'm trying to apply it within. And I think that leads into this and where I'm in this constant struggle to try and you know figure it out for myself. I think context is key and understanding what it is you're trying to say and and how that fits into the environment you're working within. So this quote kind of resonated with me and speed is a number of different things depending on who you speak to. So for people like myself, speed is more often than A to B, but within football, a lot of people can come across as, as being quick if you like, and that may be through speed of movement. It may be through tactically speed of thought, or it may be through technically, that is the ability to play quick under one or two touch and pass the football. So I think understanding context was, was really important for me in my development. So this is a story, if you like, that I'm, I'm gonna try and share and paint a picture for you guys. And it probably started for me just over three years ago when I rejoined QPR, um, the first team that is. And I just thought to myself, right, how am I gonna go about these next few years and what do I believe in? And this was the overriding thought, if you like, that has guided me uh, over the last number of years. And it's something that stays at the forefront of my mind. And that is that methods are many, principles are few, methods may change, but principles never do. So having that train of thought, I'm hoping will come across as I get into this presentation today. So I mentioned it's like a story. So like any story, there's a start, middle and end. So to start with me, like I said, this was three years ago. So I really needed to get a good understanding of what I was getting myself into, which was the, the first team environment again. So understanding what the game demands were, what do they look like? How can I better understand them so that that will help me paint, the, uh, get the players where we need to get to. And that was a real identification process that I went into. From there, it was about investigating it. We all say we want to train the way we play, but how can I, as a fitness coach or sports scientist, provide better tools or understand the game better to ensure we have the best opportunity to do so? And then finally, the end of the story, 
hopefully be the best bit was how we piece it together and what the implementation of those processes look like within our program today. So to start with the end of mind, when I was thinking about that, there was three key things that came to mind for me. So understanding our game demands, what, how do we play? How do QPR play? What does that look like? Not only that, what is the trend of football? Where is it going? And how can we not necessarily get ahead of it, but how can we better prepare for it? And then finally, with that information, how can we organize it within our train? And what does that look like? So this is how my philosophy began to take shape. Um, I put myself in probably uncomfortable situations at the start, but I wanted to be uh, in a room with people that were much smarter than me. And a lot of what I'm going to show and share today, I've taken from other people and tried to adopt and mold. So I'm grateful to them. They, they know who they are. These are just a small handful of people that have helped me on the way. But from all these discussions I've had with various different people across various different sports, the kind of the way they pushed me was to understand in your train and philosophy in its most simplest form. And its most simplest form for me that I took from them were understanding the principle of specificity and understanding progressive overload. And if you can have those two key things, they will then guide the development of your program. So for the game demands, I dug into the literature. That was the place I started. And it showed me things that I'm sure we're all familiar with that we've seen with a quick search. Things we know, a player will typically do 10 to 13K. We know the game is acyclical in nature. And we know that elite level players, when compared to more moderate level players, can do more. Now, when I was looking at this, the things that caught my eye were the first sentence, typically, okay, what about atypical? What does that look like? Unpredictable in the second sentence. Okay, should we just let that happen and allow that to happen? Or can we better prepare so that when that does occur, we know our players can achieve what they need to and then higher intensities for longer in the final sentence. Like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Can we dig into it more? And again, more recent research then was, and I've been a culprit of this, so program and volume and intensity according to whole match data samples, and then neglecting the fact that it doesn't reflect any sort of fluctuation in intensity. So when I've gone through this, the kind of questions I had in, in my head at the time were, if the sport of football or soccer is in, intermittent in nature, then why do we report and profile in whole match data samples? And then does the term game demands truly define the demands of the game? Now that's not to say there is one demand that encompasses the whole game of football, but could we look across what makes up the game a little bit more closely? Objectively, that's what the research told me. I went about looking at the game then a little bit closer with a different eye. So this was three years ago when we played Wolves, who I think to this day are probably still the best team I've seen in the championship. This was early in the first half. I think it was the 15th minute, if I'm correct. And I'll just get you to follow our fullback in this clip. So it's just under 60 seconds in length. And physically, he does everything that's asked for him. He's not overexerting himself. He's not doing anything that he can't perform. Technically and tactically, he's carrying out what the manager on the day asked for him in this moment. So he's doing his job. Now, that was one instance. Two minutes later, without anything in the game necessarily changing, we see this clip. So he starts more or less halfway up the pitch. This clip is very similar in duration, so just under 60 seconds as well. And you'll see as it develops, he goes from halfway up the pitch, the edge of his box. He'll then transition and sprint to the opposition half. Play breaks down. And then he must transition to defend again. So within the space of two minutes, we see two di very different requirements from our fullback. And up until that point, any sort of whole match or part match or segmented match analysis would piece these two moments together and we'd lose this second clip, which is, you know, that's what we're marked on in terms of physical staff. Can we have players that can sustain these demands if and when they occur? So that gave me a better understanding of the general game demands and kind of left um, a pathway for me to explore. So 
I wanted to know where's the game going and what does the future of football look like? Now, no one knows, but what we tried to do is identify some trends about where it's going. This paper on the left was an interesting one. It looked at uh, the evolution of World Cup final games from 1966 to 2010 and what that entailed from physical, technical and the tactical point of view. I've just taken three key findings from it that I thought were interesting. So the gameplay between that time period has quite significantly decreased. So it's just above 50% at the minute. And as you can see in 2030, if this trend continues, it'll be less than half. So half of the game is actually active. So the sport is becoming more intermittent in nature. The ball speed that it's traveling is increasing. So technically the players can um, look after the football at a greater pace and handle the football at a greater pace. And finally, the frequency of passes per minute is increasing. So again, tactically, that is probably changing the picture that players see more often. So physically, technically, tactically, within the game of football, there's a clear trend that it's getting quicker. And I'm sure we've all seen this, the, the Premier League study, key learnings that what we see here, distance isn't necessarily changing between this time period, 2006 to 2012. But what is changing is the number of actions, the high speed running outputs, the number of uh, sprint distance and passes. So all in all, this concept of or this idea of high intensity efforts is becoming more and more of a determinant factor. So finally then, how we organize training, and what's gonna be our, our key factor in terms of uh, training organization. So we sat down as a department and thought about, right, what's the key characteristics and what are the key factors that will make us more successful? Key factor, uh, sorry, a key char characteristic rather for us is speed. We know that speed is so important. There's numerous research papers out there that attribute speed as a key characteristic within football players. And equally, we know the injury rate is equally as important. Keeping your best players on the pitch for the duration of the season has been attributed with more successful teams. We know high speed running actions constitute the most crucial aspects of the game, and they directly contribute towards uh, key moments within the game. So if we can expose them um, to speed as a characteristic, it's, it's more advantageous to us, but also from an injury point of view, ensuring that we do expose them to it regularly will help them um, be less susceptible to injury should that happen in the game. Bottom line was speed kills. So that's what we chased. In terms of asking how, uh, if we, we train the way we play, some of the key things that we wanted to know were, what are the, the session design considerations we need to be looking at? If we didn't necessarily have the answers in-house, who can we learn from? Who can we turn to that might be able to provide some knowledge and understanding that can help guide us? And probably the biggest learning for me was once I've done that and seen it and shared and, and gathered the information rather, how can I take that information and make it my own? Understanding that the environment I'm working in and the players I'm dealing with is very different to some of the really great places I've visited. So putting our own stamp on it was really important to me in this process. What guided me along the way was this research and innovation model. This was, I first saw this from a good friend of mine, Perry Stewart in the academy. And he put this in place to not necessarily um, not bring ideas to the table, but to ensure that the ideas we did bring to the table went through a stringent scientific process be before they were implemented. So once we find those, okay, bring it to the table. What is it? Why would it work? How would it work? What may be the benefits of it? And then can we put it through that process of level two? Okay, we're considering it. Do your research on it. What does it say? And then we gradually increase the use of it if it is deemed to be effective. And this is something that stuck with me throughout the whole process of this. So the investigation process. This study largely occurred off the back of those clips I showed earlier about wolves. We wanted to break the game down to its most minute form and we isolated periods of ball in play uh, and identified what the workload was in those clips. So anytime the ball was out for a throw in, corner kick, there was a substitution, a goal, we eliminated the data from that and solely looked at those individual moments when the ball was active. We did it on both an academy front and a first team front. 
some of the things that came out of the, the, the papers or the, the research group, if you like, were the academy actually had a higher max demand. So max ball and play would be similar to worst case scenario, if you like. The academy boys actually had a higher um, max demand, but the first team players had more regular peaks in workload across those time periods. So that was interesting. And probably the second one then was, as we, we know or could imagine, the ball and play date is time dependent. So will naturally decrease over time due to a whole host of reasons. But it was a start for us and it provided objectivity around the, the concept. So we put it to the test. First of all, we started with it in a rehab set and a return to play, if you like. So each player had max and mean thresholds that we were aware of. And we had two key questions when they were returning to play. Can they achieve these outputs in isolated running? And if they can, can we progress them then to achieve it within football specific practice? So by having the Statsport software and instantaneous feedback, we can have a conversation as this is happening live with the player and say to them, okay, you need to achieve X meters per minute in this set of runs, off you go. If he can do that, we might push him to his max. This might be across one session or multiple sessions. But then when he progresses from there, we add in some football context. So this player is a fullback. So once we get him on the football, can we put him in positions you'll see on the game? So he plays right side, plays into midfield. There might be an overlap and run. All the key actions he does, defending the front post, defending the far post, but using that objectivity of those ball and play um, normative data to guide what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that gives us two things that we look for. Is it specific? It's specific to the individual based on our match data. And we can also progressively overload that by moving from mean to max, and then we can go super max if needs be. That was our first tool that we looked at. Our second tool that we looked at was this concept of player density. Truth be told, player density is something I didn't understand for quite a while. The concept for those that maybe this is new for is, it refers to the number of players that are in a certain playing area. So for example, um, the length of the area you play a small set of game multiplied by the width multiplied by the number of players. And that gives you an area per player ratio, if you like. I never really got my head around that. I've read little bits about it, but what kind of helped my thought process was these, um, these two documents, if you like. So after every major tournament, FIFA published a technical report. So as you can see, it's the World Cup on your left and the Champions League on your right. And within that, there's some really interesting bits of information, largely from a technical point of view, but physically they, they show some key bits that maybe us championship clubs aren't necessarily as privy to. So on your right, they'll show average distance covered in terms of meters per minute. They show you sprints uh, and then they show you the quickest sprint. So the clip being the quickest from last year's Champions League, which is, of course is Virgil van Dijk, as you see. So it just highlights some of the key information, but what it also does, it provides these quite interesting team graphics from, again, both Champions League and World Cup. So it gives you average distance covered across games, some key features of both teams. But what took my eye around the player density concept was, if you see on both graphics, they've got this average in possession graphic. The one that's easier to read is probably on the England one. So I picked England for the reason being at this time we were in and out of the 3-5-2. So I thought the system may match up. If you have a look at the central graphic um, in terms of the pitch, it says a 44 by 29. That's their average shape in possession. And when I saw that box, I just thought maybe there's something in that that we can exploit and use. So the video I found online was from a World Cup group game which Spain were playing. So the start of the video plays with showing the team out of possession and again there's some interesting things there in terms of where you're uh, defending in relation to your goal, what does your shape look like, so on and so forth. But the thing that was interesting to me as I said was Spain's shape. So you can see that graphic and it pauses on roughly 800 meters. So in this instance 800 meters, 10 players, 
your area power player would be about 80 meters, give or take. So the concept began to unravel in my head a little bit as I was going through this. Okay, I'd learned it, I tried to make it our own. How can I adapt it to suit us? Now, my video editing skills weren't necessarily the same as FIFA's, so bear with me, but tried to highlight each player on the outside. So in this instance, it was your back three, your wide players and your center forward. I appreciate he's dropped in, but hopefully you can get the idea. And when it freezes, that was a rough shape we were playing off in this snapshot. So with some of our games, I went back and looked at that and saw could I make sense of it and could I apply it to us. What I took from it was I was able to work out an area per player ratio, which you see on the right side of the column. For our 10 players, it was about 1,250 meters, give or take. So when I extrapolated that for one player, it was one per 125 meters. Now, what that allows us to do, if we're sitting down and we're planning any sort of small sided game, if it's a 2v2, for example, we know there's four players on the pitch. We multiply the number of players by the ratio and it gives us an area size, as you see, of 500 meters squared. And then the, the knowledge of the coach or whoever's organizing the session can come into it, whether that is, you know, you want more length in your pitch design or more width, that comes up to you, but you've got an area size to work off. And what it is, it's specific to our game. It's specific to our style of play. Now, there's loads of research that I've looked at that will yield similar numbers to the numbers I'm suggesting, but hopefully the process you will see is linking it to our style of play. So it's specific, but what it also allows us to do is progressively overload it. We can then underload it if we want to go smaller, so decrease the ratio, or equally, if we want to overload in weeks where we can push the boys a little bit harder, for whatever reason, we can increase that ratio. In terms of practically applying it, quite simply, again, a lot of this may look similar to similar people, but hopefully the, the underlying principles to how we achieve what we're doing are clear for people to see. So in this instance, 2v2, there's four players on the pitch, not including the goalkeepers in this instance. And then we gradually increase the pitch sizes as the games evolve. So 2v2, progress to a 3v3, before finally working up to a 4v4. And like I said, it provides a platform then for us to progress and build over time, whether that be weeks or days or weeks or whatever it may be. So that was our second tool to, keep, to tick our boxes. The final two we looked at, and truth be told, this probably evolved from my understanding of ball in play as my first tool was this concept of game speed. And I think Jace Delaney was the, the first, or he was the first I came across that spoke about this concept. And it's something I personally really like and think there's a lot of value in. I think it reflects the, the competition that we're, we're chasing or the intensity that we're chasing a little bit more. And it's summarized in that second point there that due to the intermittent and acyclical nature of football, a method like this is more appropriate. What it is for those that maybe aren't familiar with it is it, it, it takes all your match data and we can model it. And the, the output, if you like, is we can across 10 minute intervals here in the graph on your right, we can get in this instance, distance outputs for each individual minute. So the tool then would be, if we want to do, as the example shows, a five minute drill, our game speed, if you like, when the game is live and active, is about 150 meters per minute. Now this is mock data, but hopefully you can get the idea. I think the people that I've learned most from on this have been the likes of your rugby clubs, um, both Australian and English here that I've seen. I think they use this to great effect. And I also learned an awful lot from Rich Aikenhead at the FA, who was very kind and, and shared um, some of his thoughts around this. So I think it's something that personally we are trying to evolve within the club and we're trying to develop with. Um, we've got 
our own research team that are, are have been great. Um, we've got a PhD student, Mark Connor, working on this. We've got a friend of ours up in the University of Suffolk, Mark Obito, helping us out. And this is just a sample of one of our games that we've been able to, to, to develop, if you like. And that's our game speed for 10 players from one game. So you can see the curve plotting. But what we're trying to develop is a really helpful tool that can provide some objective data that is specific to our game and will allow us to progressively overload to, uh, over time to develop our players. Again, this just shows one minute a snapshot of what the player's output looks like and how we can better understand it through these kind of tools. So when we put it together, if you like, and begin working this, it evolves your session design. So when you're sitting down with coaches and providing um, some of this support, okay, what's the game format? 8v8 plus goalkeepers, is there any sort of magic man on that is there outside bounce players what does that look like no straight game okay perfect what's the game format how many sets are we doing what's the duration of the working period and then what's the rest interval again all things we can manipulate based on what the outcome of the session is and what the periodization of the bigger picture looks like is there any coach restrictions so is there an offside line is there limited touches does every player have to be in a certain half to score? Is there anything like that? We can provide some density measures. We then know the area size that we're working towards. And finally, we link in some of this game speed, objective data that we have. So in this instance, we were trying to get the boys above 135 meters per minute as an example. So then using your tools, it helps the design. And then you can review it once the session has panned out. But everything we're looking for is speed within the game. So finally, in terms of piecing it together, how we pull our program together in terms of the application of some of these training principles, both within a team focused prescription and then individually, how we improve the individual or what kind of framework, if you like, do we go through? I took this and adapted it from a presentation I saw from Dan Paff it was probably four or five years ago at this stage, he spoke about the concept of generational considerations in any sport design. And I really liked the idea. And I suppose what I took from it was at the, at the top of everything we do is how we play. Like that is the most important thing on a Saturday. And we've got to have an understanding of how we work back from that. I know some people talk about reverse engineering and ideas like that but for me you can retrace the game back to the core foundation of what we're working on so specific in in my head the way i look at it is that may be including physical technical and tactical elements of the game integrated may be working on two of those so that may be physical and technical technical and tactical or any combination of those three variables Isolated from our point of view, that's your physical development in terms of your skills or pitch based work um, or capacities or things like that. So in the example, it might be change direction. And then the foundation for those qualities is built in the gym. So how can we develop those key qualities we need so that the players can thrive throughout that process and ultimately on match day. So as I mentioned, a quick snapshot of some of the work we do within the gym, where we look to build a foundation as wide as possible for these players. So depending on what they need, where we are in the season, can we develop strength qualities, speed qualities, power qualities? Can we give them a robustness that they can handle the demands of the championship, a 50 plus game season? Can we look after any niggles or any previous injury that they may have and program effectively so that then when they hit the grass, they've got the best chance to do what we're asking from them. If we progress then to, a period, uh, to isolated activity, when we say this to the players, we always try and provide that context that I'm seeking. So why are they doing what they're doing? Where's the, the link to the game? Why is it relevant? And I try and draw on world-class examples to paint the picture for them as opposed to me saying it. So in this instance, we were looking at um, the Netherlands front three. And the topic was from a football sense, pressing from the front, but isolated physical quality. It was change of direction and acceleration. 
So if we keep an eye on the Dutch front three, three different types of pressing, if you like, or acceleration in terms of change of direction, a roll and start into an acceleration, and then finally, the player that scores the goal, it's a roll and start acceleration into a sprint. So we take this information that we see on the, the world stage, and we try and apply it real simply in some of our physical development warm ups So change direction, acceleration, just simply working around mannequins, add some complexity to it, increase the difficulty, make things competitive, and then add it into a sprint. Change of direction, often acceleration, mimicking a press into a sprint. And the, the goal for all of us, no matter what we're doing, is we want to see this on a Saturday or in this instance on a Friday night. So the team on the front foot, pressing from the front, accelerate and change direction qualities so that it benefits the team and what we're doing. So real simple crossing and finishing drills. Can we get players running in relation to the football, picking up some speed, and then have the ability to finish when it matters most? And when it matters most is, like I said, on a Saturday. When we see these situations arise, does that player have the ability to hit that speed? Do we have a second one that can join them? And ultimately, we want to be able to better convert those chances. Finally, then the specific nature of football. So can the player physically, technically, and tactically look after the football and everything that the game entails? So world-class example where we have these type of players that have the ability to do this with the body and with the ball in the game. To have these moments, what can we do to help our players? We've got similar players to the one that we showed. What can we do to help them and their development? Can we put them in situations where they've got multiple 1v1s, multiple repeated actions in a short space of time? Can we provide a design that allows him to get his outcomes within the session? So that when those moments come on a Saturday, like I said, we've got players that can do this. They can skip by one player, two players. They can go by multiple players in a short space of time and be comfortable on the football. That's the type of player we want at our club. And physically, we need to do what we can to support that. And that process doesn't change necessarily for team or for the individual. We look at it in both ways. The only thing that may change is the process we go through in terms of how we plan, do, and review. Individual, there may be a little bit more of a time frame to work with, depending on who the player is in their specific situation but it all goes back to the game. Okay, what do they need to achieve in the game? What are they good at or what can they maybe improve at? And we work back from there. I think one of the key things to try and summarize this or, or wrap this up was, I've been lucky to meet Tony Strudwick, who many of you may know the face a couple of times and he's always offered me great advice. And I saw him at Cohesive Coaching a couple of years um, ago present and I think it links to the message I'm trying to say that these tools necessarily aren't there to hold players back. It's quite the opposite. We want to push the boundary. We want the players to train hard and fast as often as is acceptable or is allowed. You know, sports science doesn't have to sit here and the art of coaching sits there. It's not a continuum. It needs to be integrated, hence the cohesive, cohesive coaching. And I think one of the, the big issues of, of our current generation coming in through is, is that sports science, physiotherapy, the medical component is putting limitations on performance. Our job is to create newer athletes, the football athlete of the future, who is robust, who is resilient, and can cope with increases in load. But really the whole idea of the physical component will be to increase the bandwidth capability of our athletes, mentally and physically, by exposing them to different stresses. And I took a lot from that talk. I think he summarizes it really nicely, exposing the players to this, pushing them. Can they do more? Always wanting to try when sensible to do more. And I think that's the, the summary I, I'd like to, to wrap up on. Like All these methods and all the people that have been helpful in my journey to get me to this point, I've, I've always done it to develop my own philosophy, but also to develop everything around QPR. And that's where our way has come from, finding things that, can benefit our players to give them the opportunity to be the best they can be. To finish, this is what I'd like to leave with, and this is probably for 
I think everyone can do this, but you know, probably the more younger, inexperienced coaches, I think, may find more value out of this. But taking a step back when we have the time and opportunity now with the current situation, and just asking yourself, what is it that you believe in? What's your personal and professional philosophy? How do you do things? Why do you do things? What does that look like? And that's been a really valuable experience for me in, in this last two, three years, really taking a step back and figuring that out. In saying that, by sharing all this knowledge and not necessarily my knowledge, but by people sharing knowledge with me, it's made me better. And I think knowledge is nothing unless challenged and shared by people having an open mind, which more and more are doing now by putting this out there, by having all these events and you know online webinars it's great to show and see what other people are doing but then equally take that identify early on what you can use how you can use it and how you can adapt it into your philosophy and how you do that is by having really solid and sound principles understand what applies to you and how you can use that within your environment so let your principles guide you thank you very much any questions i'd, I'd be happy to take Cheers, Dylan. Thanks for that. Um, really, really informative presentation and clear description of your, your approach and your philosophy there. Um, you know, covering things like ball and play, like game speed, worst case scenario, max intensity period, whatever you call it, um, and integrating video as well with your, with your data to, to give context to that, like among other things that you mentioned, all those things are, are things that anyone with a GPS system has the power to do. So, um, no, cheers for that. Um, we have got a few questions in through the, the Q&A box. So anyone who is logged on can, of course, submit questions at any time during the presentations. Um, so this one is, is from Barry and he's asked um, just with the various managers that you have dealt with, um, how have you managed to communicate your philosophy to the manager and how have you had to maybe adapt this with the manager's philosophy? And then there's a sort of a follow-up from that one is, um, is this a sort of a, a top-down approach communicated to the academy and have you met any resistance from, from that? Um, I think the, to answer the first question in terms of different managers and working with different managers, I think ultimately a manager will have their own way of working. And I think it's, it's really important that we remember that we are only support staff in the grand scheme of it. So we're only trying to provide help or I don't even want to use the word guidance. It's not guidance, but provide some information that we think can make their way of doing things better. I think for me personally, I've been lucky to work with some really good bosses um, over the last three to five year period who've been at the forefront of delivering messages and trying to, push the boundaries in terms of how we do things and how we can improve as a, a department and as a club so I think they've been the face of it and probably taken this as far as we can and I think it's going to be something that evolves over time when as we continue to gain a better understanding and collect more data and can dig deeper into our research and what the game tells us it will naturally evolve over time um, in terms of the second point about answering if this is a top down uh, at the minute no it's not and this is all these tools are definitely specific to the first team environment um the academy is is a lot it's a different it's a, a different world in terms of developing players and how they develop players this is just focused purely towards our first team and trying to maximize our training time from a physical standpoint in those limited windows that we have okay oh, that all makes sense um and then the, the second question i have for you is from david and he asked if have you found across the varying pitch dimensions of of small sided games i imagine um and player numbers that the number of high intensity actions were in line with the the output that you'd expect and what kind of rule changes would you would you apply if if you weren't seeing that in your data um, I think that the truth on that is we still have so much more data we need to collect before we can be sure on that. I think the, the player density stuff is still being developed um, in-house for us. 
and we don't have anything clear and concise to develop on it. But in terms of rule changes, again, I don't have anything objective to go off, but rules such as every player follows one player on the opposition team or there might be a touch restriction or, you know, every player over halfway can often be a really good one to increase some of your distance measures. It makes it a bit more transitional or I think rules like that where that's probably more down to the creativity and understanding that the coach and um, we provide the design and then the coach can often take it where he wants to go. That's that's where their expertise I think can come in and take this program to the to the next level. Okay. Perfect, Dylan. Um thanks a million for, for presenting, for logging on and 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 sharing sharing the stuff that you're doing at QPR with us and um best of luck when when things get back up and running. Brilliant. Thank you very much.